shocking thing I've ever learned about Governor Chris Christie. He does not drink coffee. It never has. No, no coffee, ever. I started to try to drink in college and I didn't like it. And so then, I think just once I didn't acquire the taste for it then, I learned how to get myself going in the morning and doubt it. And so I've never done it. And it's great because I was, I was saying it to Steve um, before we came out here that um, it, it causes no problem in our house that because I'm not fighting with my wife. My wife needs the coffee. Um, and there's no arguing with Mary Pat in the morning about who's getting the coffee and whatever. And I can make the coffee and seem really generous. <laughs> it's a, it it he has been all kinds of opportunities to keep a 37-year marriage going. So I like that. So we're going to pause for a moment. Next, uh, how's his audio? Sound good? Is it mic any closer? We're good? Okay. So next thing you'll hear is the open, and we want to thank the presidents here. Thank you very much for being with us. Thanks to New England College. We'll start in about 10 seconds. Now, from New England College in Hanover, New Hampshire, it's a serious exam in New England College Town Hall with former Governor Chris Christie on his 2024 presidential campaign. Here's your host, Steve Scully. And we want to welcome Governor Chris Christie, who is here at New England College in Hanover, New Hampshire. We have a great group of students and New Hampshire residents. So, Governor, thank you very much for being with us. Happy to be here. If you watch the debate, this question will make sense. Should I begin with the UFO question? <laughs> <laughs> not, if, not unless you want the same answer. It's not even the same answer. I, it was, there was a crazy debate in so many ways. Now, look, I participated in, I think, eight of them in 2016. Um, and, and that was nuttier than any of the eight that I participated in in 2016. I think the coming to the audience in the arena, um, some of the, the questions. I mean, well, think about this. With all the problems we have, Steve, in our country, we started with rich men north of Richmond, and we ended with UFOs. Um, we never asked one question about entitlements. We never answered, asked one question about the national debt. We never asked one question about taxes. In, 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 the, in the two hours, but we had time to talk about rich men north of Richmond and UFOs. So it was, uh, it was a little bit nutty, but I was very, very pleased, as you might imagine, to have gotten the UFO question. So we will talk about some of the more serious issues. Thank you for being with us, and again, thanks to this beautiful campus of New England College and the staff and the, the president, who is here as well. In Washington today, Speaker Kevin McCarthy is beginning the process of an impeachment inquiry against President Joe Biden. And my question is not what the House is doing, but the weaponization of impeachment and what this means for the future of the presidency. Look, I think going all the way back to the Clinton impeachment, that um, we've cheapened it over time. And I remember thinking at the time that, you know, Richard Nixon resigned in order to avoid putting the country through an impeachment proceeding. He did the right thing. He did. I mean, and you look back on it now, and in the last 50 years, that turns out to have been a great act of patriotism by somebody who probably knew they were going to be convicted, Goldwater told them, but that also tells you another difference in our system. It was Barry Goldwater who went to the White House and told him, you don't have the votes to survive in the Senate. And he said, how many do I have? Goldwater said, six or seven, and not mine. And said that to the President of the United States right across from him in the White House. Um, everybody now keeps their uniforms on. Almost everybody keeps their uniform on all the time. So it's also not incentivize a President to do the right thing. Um, because they figure their folks can stick with them all along, and so why should I leave? Um, I, I think there, are, there should be an inquiry made about what has gone on in the Biden's business situations, but I think they can do that through their oversight function and have the DOJ special counsel that's been appointed now in the Hunter Biden situation look at that as well. So it's not that I don't think this stuff should be looked at. It should, because President Biden's been very direct about saying he had absolutely no involvement with his son's business. Yet now we have the son's business partner saying, hey, he's been on calls all the time with clients. And I think if that's the case, then 
that's got to be looked at to make sure that it didn't go further than that. Um, because if it got to the point where, as vice president, he in any way shared in the money that went along with that, I think that would be a really significant problem. Impeachable? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Because you can't look. The, the last two presidencies have been what appears to the American people to be, in some respects, kind of an ongoing grift. I mean, you know, you've got uh, Jared Kushner and Ivanka Trump making 40 plus million dollars a year while they're serving in the White House. And then Jared leaves the White House and gets $3 billion from $2 million from the Saudis and a half a billion each from the Qataris and the Emiratis after the president had put him in a major role on Middle East negotiations. Somebody who had no experience in foreign policy of any kind, um, who was essentially the son of a real estate developer in New Jersey, who a family I've gotten over really well over the years. Um, and so, and, and things like Donald Trump paying um, Kimberly Guilfoyle, his son's girlfriend, $60,000 out of campaign money to give a three minute speech on January 6th at the rally. Or him paying for Melania's stylist out of campaign money, $208,000 so far, and calling it political strategy. Um, you know, and then you have Joe Biden, look, what we can say about Hunter Biden, and I knew Bo Biden pretty well. And when I was his attorney, he was attorney general of Delaware, and we did some matters, our offices together. He was a very straight, upfront, bright guy. Um, I don't see any reason why anybody would be hiring Hunter for anything unless his name was Biden. And that's a concern because you, you now look at it and it's made me say things like, if I'm elected president, nobody from the Christie family will, will benefit financially from my presidency. When did you ever have to say that before? And, and, but it's, it's happening. And, and so I think it's something that's a serious concern, Steve, for folks. I really do. And, and so I, I'm not, I don't think there's enough evidence at this moment to open a full-blown impeachment on Joe Biden. And I, I think that wouldn't be smart to do. But should they use their oversight function to find out what was really going on there? I think, yeah, they should. I have to laugh, though, when you say, you know, the Kushner family, he basically sent his dad to jail. Uh, basically, I did. <laughs> so are you saying that the Trump family is corrupt? Yes. Sure. I mean, it's just, it, I mean, it's, it's readily apparent. I mean, when you pay your, your son's girlfriend 60 grand out of campaign money to give a three minute speech, you're using money that people donated to you. And by the way, that money was donated by people who wanted to fund him to fight the stolen election. When they donated that money, they didn't think 60 grand was going to Kimberly Guilfoyle to give a three-minute speech. They didn't think $208,000 was going to Melania's stylist, right? So I, I don't know what you would call that other than corrupt. And sending Jared Kushner to the Middle East and then having him within six months, and by the way, the $2 million he had from the Saudis, up until five days ago, he hadn't invested any of that money. He got it six months after they left office, in the middle of 2021. We're now in the third quarter of 2023. That's two years he hadn't invested in the nickel of the money, but paid himself his management fee out of that money, which is a percentage of the $2 billion every quarter. For what? What was he managing? Make sure every once in a while I pick up the phone and call the bank. Is the $2 billion still there? And good. Okay, great. But, I mean, you know, this, so, yeah, that looks like corruption to me, Steve. Yeah. We are in Hennigan, New Hampshire, with former Governor Chris Christie. We'll get to questions in just a moment as we get those lined up. These are your words referring to Donald Trump. Wherever he goes, I'll go, and we'll wind up talking to each other one way or another. So just follow up. How's that going to work? We're going to see. I mean, you know, look, he's been pretty much hiding in the basement. You know, and it's interesting because I was talking to my staff today about how we actually execute on this. This is a guy who's taking advantage of the fact that he lives behind the walls of private clubs and he has secret service protection. 
So what we're going to basically have to do is go to public events of his and try to confront him. If he won't show up at debates, then that's what we're going to have to do. I mean, I don't know how else to do it, and I think if yeah, that's what we need to do, then that's what we'll do. You can't do some of the normal stuff, like normally I would, you know, we do a press conference outside his house, but you can't do that because he lives behind the walls of these private clubs, and I wouldn't be able to get into them. Um, not that I'd want to, but I, if, even if I could, I, 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 if I wanted to, I couldn't get in. Even as a former governor? Even as a former governor. Um, yeah, no, I, in Bedminster, you know, I, they would stop me. I'm confident now um, at the gates. I used to be able to go in there whenever I wanted to, not so much anymore. So we're going to see how exactly we execute on it. But he's got to show up at debates. If he doesn't, then I'm going to show up where he is. And so he's doing an event, you know, um, in California at the end of the month after the debate. Maybe I hang around a bit longer in California and go there. Um, but I'm going to be someplace where he is um, between now and the third debate. And we'll see whether that makes him just prefer to come in a more controlled circumstance. In the last debate, one of your opponents, the Vic Ramaswamy, said that you were bought and paid for by the GOP establishment. So my question is, how much money did you get? Uh, you know, I mean, look, this is what you could do um, when you're a 38-year-old guy with no experience and pliable principles, which is what the fake really has turned out to be. I mean, the reason, one of the reasons he said that that night was because he had said Donald Trump was the greatest president of the 21st century during the debate. And I responded, well, that's not what you said about him in your book a year ago. And he said, that's a lie. Well, like, then the next day, even Fox News came out and said, no, that actually was true. He said all these horrible things about Trump in his book. Um, he, you know, he's anti-George Soros, but he took a George Soros scholarship to go to law school. And he, he then... Um, said, well, the only reason I took that money was because I couldn't afford to go otherwise. Then he released his tax returns, and he had made $700,000 the year before. I think you could have fit in somewhere in there, even after tax, you know, paying your tuition to go to law school. So, look, you know, I haven't, you know, been bought and paid for by anybody. Um, I, I don't shy away from having been a lifelong Republican. I'm proud of it. Um, that means I've supported a lot of different candidates over time, and I voted in every election, unlike a vague who didn't vote until uh, uh, three years ago for the first time, despite the fact that he's 38 years old. I mean, I think the minimum we should ask for for people who want to be president of the United States is that maybe they participated in an election as a voter, <laughs> like as a minimum. Maybe that should be the bar. And we have two like really low bars we're setting now in American politics, and, and I seem to be unique in why to require these things. Like, you should have to have voted before you ran for president, and you should be a convicted felon to be president. Somehow these now seem to be high bars that you have to mount, but I think at a minimum, we should at least require that 35 years old, natural born American citizen, and not be a convicted felon, and maybe have voted in an election or two before you decide you want to run for president. Governor Christie, a lot of questions, including students here at New England College. Tell us your name and please proceed. Um, my name is Leah Bowman, and I would like to know what is the role of the federal government in the cost of higher education? Well, I think the role of the federal government in the cost of higher education is to make the cost higher. Um, and they've done that by making, I think, loan money so liberally available. And as a result, what's happened is that schools don't feel like they need to compete. Um, on price. Because if they raise the price, then you just borrow more money to be able to pay it. And a lot of you then leave places like this, and I left my education with debt that I had to pay, and it took me 10 years to pay off that debt after I left college and law school. Um, I said this eight years ago, and I still believe it today. I don't think that colleges and universities should be permitted to raise their tuition and fees above the rate of inflation. And if they do, then they should be ineligible for any federal aid. If everyone else can live with inflation increases, should mean that colleges and universities can too. 
And the fact that folks in your generation have to run up more and more and more debt um, is just unfair. It puts you further and further behind in your ability to be able to do that. But we're not going to fix that problem by, by forgiving your debt, as nice as that would be for you. And you speak, you speak as a dad, one in college, you put all four kids through college. Yes, and like, look, I, the, the, the tuition fees, like the all-in costs at Notre Dame this year, where my daughter is a junior, is $81,000. Now, I, look, Notre Dame's a great place, and we had another daughter who graduated from there. But think about this, when my daughter, my daughter is now 27, so she's in the class of 2018 from Notre Dame. This current daughter will be in the class of 2025. When my younger daughter, my older daughter rather, went to Notre Dame, her tuition was 61,000. It's now 81,000. Like, come on. I've been to that campus. Like, I don't see anything that additional that would, that would call for a 33% increase in the cost of going there from 2018 to 2023 in five years. We want to welcome our audience here at New England College. This is a Sirius XM town hall conversation with former New Jersey Governor 2024 presidential candidate Chris Christie. More of your questions from the audience. Thank you. JP Marzullo. Hey, JP. Welcome, Governor. I have a two-part question. Uh, one, uh, what would you do with the, the problem that we have right now that uh, North Korea is now meeting with Putin? I know you went to the Ukraine. Maybe you can enlighten us on how you would handle that situation. It's very sensitive, as you know. Well, look, I'm glad you asked that. I think there are folks in this race who are talking about the idea that we shouldn't be helping Ukraine. And there's two reasons, in my view, why we should be. Reason number one is we promised to. And people haven't even talked about this, and I'm going to bring this up in the next debate. In 1991, when the Soviet Union fell, many of the Soviet Union's nuclear weapons were in Ukraine. Because at that time, Ukraine was part of the Soviet Union. We asked Ukraine to return those nuclear weapons to Russia. They agreed to do it with the proviso that if Russia ever took aggressive action against them, we would defend them. Separate and apart from NATO obligations, they're not part of NATO, we gave them that promise. And they complied with their end of the bargain. They returned multi-war-headed nuclear weapons to their neighbor who has now invaded them. Second, this is a proxy war with China. If you have any doubt about it, all that doubt should be eliminated when Putin meets with Kim Jong-un. North Korea is a client state of China. Kim Jong-un would not be meeting with Putin unless he had permission to do so from his Chinese protectors. So this is a, a, a coordination between China, Russia, North Korea, and Iran. And amazingly, Joe Biden announced a deal yesterday to give $6 billion in frozen assets to Iran back to them in exchange for five hostages of ours that they had, and we're returning five people that they claim are our prisoners of theirs. And to do that, just as a side on 9-11, anniversary of 9-11, I've never seen a more tone-deaf administration in my life to the people who care about what happened on September 11th, to now be dealing with and giving $6 billion to the largest state sponsor of terrorism in the world is extraordinary. So I think that when you look at Putin and, and Kim Jong-un getting together, what we need to understand is that this is three communist governments. Because let's face it, Russia can call themselves whatever they want. Putin is a KGB communist. Kim Jong-un is a communist, so are the Chinese. These are communist governments who are trying to fill a vacuum that Donald, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, and Joe Biden have left in the world by not asserting America's strength and standing up for our friends the way I think they should. And this started with Obama in 2014 and has continued going forward. And we're paying the price now for that weakness, for Trump blackmailing the Ukrainians 
for defense aid, basically saying, you give me dirt on Joe Biden, I'll give you the weapons you want. Um, Obama never giving them any defensive or offensive weapons at all during his presidency. And now Joe Biden giving them just enough, in my view, to not lose, but not enough to win. So when you look at all these things, these things are all interconnected. And by the way, the most nervous people in the world right now have to be the Taiwanese. Because they're watching to see whether America's going to stand up for Ukraine. Because if we don't, I am willing to guarantee you that China will move on Taiwan. And if you don't care about Taiwan for any other reason, I want to give you this reason to care about Taiwan. Peace. Okay? And everything else that uses semiconductors, we cool this room with semiconductors. You start your car with semiconductors. Everything that you do in our lives right now, practically, refrigerators have semiconductors in them now. I mean, two-thirds of the world's semiconductors are manufactured in Taiwan. Do we really want the Communist Chinese to decide who gets those semiconductors and who don't? Because I guarantee America will be at the back of the line if they're making the decision. So even if you don't care about America's role in the world, us as a leader, standing up for folks that are free, and stand for freedom and liberty in the world, and human rights and all the rest of those issues, if you just want to be selfish about it, care about it for that reason. So all these things are very connected, and we have to conduct a foreign policy that says we understand the interconnected nature of this, and that we're going to stand up with our friends and make sure they know when America's your friend, we'll stand with you. So, Governor, I'm going to give you a very open-ended question because you said during the debate there are some issues that were not addressed. So, you can take this any way you want, but what is America's greatest challenge right now, either domestic or foreign? I think our greatest challenge long-term domestically, Steve, is education. 39% of our 8th graders don't read at grade level. I want you to think about that. 39% of 8th graders in the United States don't read at grade level. 25% of 8th graders in the United States don't do math at grade level. We spend $400 billion a year on K-12 education in this country. $400 billion. And that's the result we're getting. For the long-term interest of this country, Steve, I can talk about entitlements and debt, and those are important things. But if we don't educate our children, you cannot be a free people. And uneducated people can't be a free society. There's too much that's required of a free society. If you're not educated, you can't read, you can't do basic math, you can't do the things that a free people need to do. And then what happens? Government comes in and does all that for you. And then the people who are in charge to decide what you can say, what you can do, where you can live, where you can work, all the rest of that. So, to me, education is core to it. We need a complete refiguring of our public education system. And I say this as a product of the public education system. I went to K-12 at public schools in New Jersey that served me extraordinarily well. And so I'm an advocate for public education. But I will tell you that public education in this country, when they're producing 39% of 8th graders who can't read at grade level, 25% of the integrators can't do math at grade level. I don't know how you define failure, but to me, that looks like failure. And so we need to do something different. And I think long term, that's the biggest challenge we have because the most powerful lobby in this country is the teachers' unions. They're the best funded, they're the most aggressive, and you saw during COVID. Joe Biden promised during the election that within 100 days of his presidency, he would have all schools reopened. Until on day two of his presidency, Randy Weingarten, the president of the American Federation of Teachers, came to the White House with a member of the AFT, Jill Biden. And all of a sudden, then schools were not reopened. So they're not putting students first, is what you're saying? The U.S. Clearly not the students first. Look, I give one example from New Jersey, and I've had legendary fights with the teachers' unions in New Jersey over the years. We know. How about this? When I became governor in the city of Newark, 
there were a hun over 100 teachers in the city of New York who every day were getting paid but did not report to a classroom. They reported to the central office in what the central office called a rubber room. These teachers were so bad that they thought it was better to pay them to sit there in the room every day and do nothing than to go into a classroom. And the unions protected these teachers and prevented the district from firing them. If that's not an example of how you don't put the students first, or the taxpayers first, but just your own personal interests first, um, I don't know what it is. We are in Hennecker, New Hampshire, on the campus of New England College, and more questions from the students are Series 6M Town Hall with former governor, Republican presidential candidate, Chris Christie. Go ahead with your question. Tell us your name. I'm Thomas Dell. I'm a student here, as well as a writer for our school's newspaper, The New Englander. And my question was, given that you haven't really aligned with um, either party so far, how, do you, how would you say um, you plan on possibly sorry, this, doing away with the two-party system if you don't really align with either one directly? Well, I am aligned with the Republican Party. Um, I'm a Republican. I've been a Republican since 1980 when I voted for the first time for Ronald Reagan. And I'm trying to win the Republican nomination for President of the United States. But I recognize that as a Republican in this country or a Democrat, you have to address the issues of folks who are not aligned with either party, folks who are independents. And they're the ones who will decide this election the general election. They did in 2020, they did in 2016, um, and they changed from 2016 to 2020. Governor, as you know, No Labels is trying to mount a third-party campaign. Republican Senator Bill Cassidy said, I might be interested in running as a third-party candidate. What are your thoughts about that? Would you run as a No Labels candidate if you don't get the nomination? No, I think it's a fool's errand. I really do. I, I think, you know, look, let's, let's be honest about why No Labels was started. They're trying to act as if they're this bipartisan group and they have supporters, Republican and Democratic supporters, but it is an organization that is designed to try to defeat Donald Trump. That's what they're designed to do. My point to them is doing a third party candidacy is not shooting with a rifle, it's shooting with a shotgun. You don't know who you're going to hit or who you're going to hurt because you're trying to attract voters that you think would otherwise vote for Donald Trump but would vote for an alternative, you don't know which way that's going to go. Secondly, the, the best third-party candidacy in my lifetime was Ross Perot, and by best I mean most successful. 19%. 19% of the vote nationwide did not win one state. Not one. One of the wealthiest guys in America at the time, self-funded his race, ran 30-minute TV commercials during that campaign where he would explain issues in great detail. The debt, the right, deficit. Right, right, and a very aggressive, smart campaign, 19%. Um, the only third-party candidacy in my lifetime that has won states was George Wallace in 1968, who ran on a strict segregationist policy. I don't think we're looking to have that again. And so, and he won states in the South purely based upon racial bias and prejudice. So if you're the nominee for the Republican Party and you accepted Milwaukee, who's your running mate? Who would you look to? Well, that's a great question. I don't think you put the, the cart before the horse on that, but I, I would say this to you. You could probably expect that I would select someone who met three criteria. Number one, that I can see that person being President of the United States if something happened to me. Two, that it's someone who had real experience so that their advice to me would be meaningful. And three, someone that I liked. Because the fact of the matter is if I don't like the person, I'm not going to want them to have in the room. I mean, it's just the, the, the truth of human behavior, right? If you pick somebody just for political purposes, but you really don't like them, and then they're your vice president, guess what? They're going to spend most of their time on Capitol Hill, um, presiding over the Senate and not having a role in the White House. So those would be the three criteria, and I think there are, you know, at least off the top of my head, 
half a dozen people in our party that I think could meet that criteria. Do you want to name names? Uh, no, not particularly. But what I would say to you is there's some obvious people, right? I would say there's some folks who anybody would consider, right? So I think anybody would consider Governor Kim Reynolds from Iowa. <laughs> Known her for a long time. I like Kim a lot. She's got practical experience. And, and she's someone who I think has the capabilities, if she wanted to be president, um, to be president. I think that's one person that, that I can name right off the top of my head that I think is someone who has those kind of capabilities. So let's just throw her name out there. We'll leave it at that. Another question. Thank you, Steve. Governor, uh, one of our great uh, partners here at New England College uh, in the Town Hall series is uh, TC Energy. So along those lines, next question. A lot of New Hampshire residents, Northeastern residents, Looking at the calendar, seeing the winter months are ahead, and the uh, oil bills, the heating bills come along with that. When it comes to the federal government's role in managing these costs, what would be your approach? Well, first off, you know, it shows you the damage of a lot of these liberal policies in states like New York, which are preventing pipelines being built from Pennsylvania through here to New England, so that more affordable natural gas could help people keep their homes here in New England. Um, and so I think one of the things we need to encourage is an all of the above policy on energy. We need to reverse the Biden policies. Do you know that now in North Dakota, and I learned this talking to Governor Burgum um, before he was a presidential candidate, but his opinions are just as valid now. They're producing a million barrels less a day in North Dakota since Joe Biden became president than before. I mean, think about that. We haven't even had that gap. So we're buying it from the Saudis. We're buying it from the Venezuelans. Um, we're, you know, we're buying oil from folks who can hold us economically hostage rather than creating our own oil and keeping prices lower. In fact, you know, the, the president has significantly depleted the strategic petroleum, petroleum reserve to try to bring gas prices down for political reasons. How do we fill that back up? at the prices they're at now. We wouldn't want to do it. So part of it is to make sure that we increase domestic production as much as we possibly can. And there's plenty of domestic energy right here in the United States that not only could serve all of our needs, we could become self-sufficient, but also could be exported as liquefied natural gas to Europeans who I think would much rather at this stage be buying this from us than they would from the Russians, given what the Russians are up to. And that would also help us from a foreign policy perspective. Um, I also think that it's time to start using nuclear energy in a much greater amount. It's a clean energy from a carbon perspective, which will help us with climate. And I can tell you, for people who have fears about nuclear energy, I governed the, the most densely populated state in America. New Jersey, you're tripping over people in New Jersey. Everywhere you turn, there's another house or another apartment. Or, and it would stun people to know that 53% of our electricity in New Jersey is generated by nuclear. We've run nuclear power plants in New Jersey for five decades, safely, securely, and doing it by producing clean electricity. More than half of our electricity in New Jersey does not contribute to carbon output. And nuclear technology today is significantly better than it was 20 or 30 years ago. And so, you know, I was glad to see that Governor Kemp in Georgia did a really smart thing, opened up the first newly built nuclear power plant in decades in this country. In Georgia, Georgians are going to benefit from that from a climate perspective and a cost perspective. And we should be doing more of it across the country. So that's another thing I would do. So more domestic production of natural oil and gas. <clears throat> I have no objection to wind and solar, but they're just not, they're not plentiful enough yet to be able to really be a stable source for our electric grid. The two most stable sources will be oil and gas and nuclear. We should exploit those to the greatest extent we can, um, make sure that people can have a reliable grid. Because we want to go to electric vehicles, I don't have any objection to that. But when Governor Newsom says he wants a no gas vehicle sold 10 years from now in the state of California, but then put out a notice earlier in the summer 
for people not to charge their electric vehicles because you'll collapse the grid. Your electric vehicle isn't worth much if you can't charge it. So we need to be able to do both, and we can do both, but we can't just cave in to environmental extremists who you know want us tomorrow to go to an all wind and solar energy source that's just not possible to do. Especially in New Jersey where I think it's the only state where they still have attendants pumping the gas. We do. <laughs> and by the way, if you don't feel like pumping your own gas, come to New Jersey. We will pump it for you. And, and I was told to see this beforehand, um, that when I first became governor, I thought, well, I guess we should go to self-serve gas, right? Everybody, 47 other, 48 other states do it. We should do it. So I said to my, my folks, let's put it in a poll just to see how people in New Jersey feel about it. 83% of New Jersey had said no self-serve gas. 83%. 91% of New Jersey women said no self-serve gas. It is the most unifying issue in New Jersey. And my wife, who grew up in Pennsylvania, and only came to New Jersey once we got married. So she pumped gas for most of her young life before we got married. She's in New Jersey now. When she goes to visit her mom in Pennsylvania, if she needs gas, she'll wait to come back to New Jersey so she doesn't have to pump it herself. So it, we are now the only state left. Oregon used to be with us. They gave self-serve gas last year, approved it. Uh, but I got to tell you, it will take a braver politician than I, Steve, to bucket 83% trend in your state when people say they don't want it, they don't want it, we're not going to do it. Very quickly, we'll get to a question by a show of hands. How many will be voting in the New Hampshire primary? Very good. Good turnout. Yep. Another question from one of the students here at New England College. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you for coming to NEC. My name is Kyle. My Hi, question Kyle. to you is, what needs to be done about misinformation and disinformation without impacting freedom of speech? Look, it's one of, the, one of the toughest questions you can ask, right? I, I think we always have to err on the side of protecting free, free speech. Because the censor, the person who's deciding what is misinformation or disinformation, is a dangerous thing, right? We just saw recently in the last couple of days a Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals decision on the Biden administration and the way they were directing social media companies to censor speech um, on social media. Um, the Fifth Circuit said it was a clear violation of the constitutional right to free speech. And, you know, uh, I, I warn people about this all the time, that you may disagree with something, but in the end, the context is got to be concerning to you. Who's deciding? what you should hear and not hear. And that's what I've talked about educated populace before. Like an educated, truly educated populace can, it takes effort, but you can grind your way through information to try to verify what's real and what isn't. So we need to be educated on this stuff. But also, be concerned about not only big government Democrats who think we should be doing this, like Joe Biden, but big government Republicans like Ron DeSantis. Now, he's in Florida, he proposes piece of legislation, the Disney Corporation comes out and says, we impose it. And what does he do? He punishes them. He then uses the levers of government and says to them, we're going to take away these tax breaks that we've been giving you for all this time because you disagree with me. And I've had some Republicans come to me and say, I think it's great, I don't like what Disney did or said. I'm like, look, I don't like what Disney said either. But, how are we going to govern ourselves? What if it was a liberal, if you're a Republican, it was a liberal Democratic governor of, of Florida, and he proposed a really liberal piece of legislation, and Disney came out and said, we're opposed to it, and he punished them. I guarantee these Republicans would be saying, oh, no, 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 don't do that. Well, speech is speech. And unless speech creates an imminent danger, imminent danger, I think we shouldn't be regulating it. So no. speaking, speaking of speech, no. uh, his words, not mine, Donald Trump referred to you as, quote, a fat pig. Yeah. When you that was one of nicer things with me. <laughs> but when you heard that, again, I think your mom, my mom, taught us better. We don't use that kind of language. Yeah. Why are the insults so personal? Okay. Well, and I mean, I think yesterday he called me mentally ill. 
and a psycho with nothing to say. So I know, you've been listening to me for like 30 minutes now, I mean, I, if I am mentally ill, I'm doing a pretty good job, I think I'm hiding it from all of you. Um, look, why are they so personal? Because that's who he is. And he's become worse over time. I've known him for 22 years. He was not like this 10, 12 years ago. Um, he's gotten progressively worse. Power has corrupted him um, in a way that is discernible. It's, it's, it's tangible. And the words that he uses about people are, are, are inane and immature. Like, uh, look, um, I hear those things that he says about me, and, and, and I think they're regrettable. But the other thing my mother taught me was, you know, um, people who you don't respect, you shouldn't worry about what they think about you. And I don't really, and by the way, I guess the other point to make on this, before we get to your question, is this is a guy who in 2015, before he got into the race for president, when he had decided that he was going to do it, urged me to run for president, said he would support me. This is a guy who asked me to chair his transition, and I did. This is a guy who asked me to chair his Drug Abuse and Opioid Commission. I did. Came forward with 110 recommendations. He adopted all of them. This is a guy who offered to be Secretary of Homeland Security twice, Secretary of Labor, and White House Chief of Staff. I prepared him for the debates at his request in 2016. I played Hillary Clinton. That'll keep you up at night. Um, and in 2020, asked me again to prepare for the debates and to play Joe Biden, and I did. Does it sound like somebody that he thinks is mentally deranged and is a psycho? You might think I'm fat big, but you know, that's an impact my ability to do all those jobs for him, um, or for him to be a bunch of other ones. This is situational opinion. Now that I'm running against him, all of a sudden I'm all these horrible things. Not only running against him, but now in second place here in New Hampshire and gaining on him. He only criticizes, just remember to listen to this. You don't see him say anything bad about Nikki Haley. Nothing bad about, about um, uh, you know, uh, Vivek Prabhaswamy. Um, he only says bad things about people who criticize him or he sees as a threat. And right now, he says the most bad things about me and Ron DeSantis. So I guess Ron and I should both feel flattered. Back to your questions. Thank you for being here today. Good morning. Thank you for coming. Um, my name is Olivia Brimmer. Um, I'm a student here. And my question for you is, on the campaign trail, you've made comments disagreeing with trans youth health care bans, stating that it's more of a parent's issue. Um, and I was just wondering, what will you do to protect the rights of trans youth and their parents to make their own decisions about their health care? This is another big government Republican thing, I think, right? Um, look, I'm a parent of four children. Nobody loves my children more than me and my wife. Nobody understands our children better than me and my wife. And nobody, nobody cares more about their futures than we do. If judgments need to be made about when a child is confused about gender and those issues arise. How can anybody think that a governor in a state would be better positioned to make those judgments for that child than their own mother and father? Now I understand we have some irresponsible parents out there too, but they're the exception, not the rule. And we shouldn't make laws for the exception. So what I would do is the same things I did in New Jersey. We signed um, legislation that protected the ability of folks to get counseling and all the rest. Um, and, and I just think that these are things, and I don't know what I would do as a parent. I have to say the truth. I've had to confront it, and I don't know what I would do and how I would counsel my children if one of them came to me with that issue. But I know this much, that I'm better off making that decision with my child and his or her health care providers with my wife, than Governor Phil Murphy of New Jersey, or Governor Chris Sununu of New Hampshire, 
for Governor Sarah Sanders of Arkansas. And by the way, you know, those are all people I know quite well, but they don't know my children. I do. So I think it's a parental decision when you're a minor. Once you're 18, it's your decision. And you get to make those decisions for yourself. I would hope that during your late teens and early 20s, you would consult your parents about it. And that it would be something that you would have a good enough relationship with your parents to be able to talk to them about those issues and get their advice and counsel along with medical professionals. But I, I don't believe that it's something that government should be in the middle of. And, uh, and I thought that's what we were for as conservatives, that we want government involved in our lives as little as possible. And that's what I've always been for. And these issues get more complicated and more difficult. But your principles should remain the same. And I think parents should be deciding about the children's education. I think parents should be deciding about the children's health care. And health care, not just physical, but mental health care as well. Governor, yeah, you ran for president in 2016. You told NPR that you have evolved and changed as a candidate. When you told your wife, Mary Kath, and your kids that you were running for president again, did they give you any advice? <laughs> yeah. Um, you smile. Yeah, because look, each one of your kids is different. Uh, this is a plan off of your question, right? I, I, Olivia, I think, um, you know, my sons were really enthusiastic about it again and really wanted me to do it. So was my wife. She, she really wants Donald Trump to lose. And she was very concerned that nobody in the Republican Party was willing to take him on directly. And she said, this is what you're good at, go and do it. And she's been completely supportive. My daughters were more reluctant. Um, my oldest daughter is concerned about my safety. And, and she's like, look, you're out there saying some very direct and difficult things. And you're not governor anymore, so you don't have state police with you all the time. And I'm worried about your safety. My younger daughter was more worried about her own life. She's like, she was thinking ahead to like, if you do really well, do I have to have secret service? And I'm like, yes. And she's like, oh, I'm in college. I don't want secret service hanging around. So she was more reluctant from a personal perspective, like, what's it going to mean for my life? My siblings didn't have to go through that. I don't want to. So they all bring their own perspectives to it. But in terms of who I am, I think my family knows that I'm, because I am with them, pretty direct and, and opinionated and we have very open conversations in our house. And so, you know, they know that's the way I'm going to be when I'm out here running for president. Um, the last thing that my oldest son said to me was, just go out there and be yourself and you won't have any regrets no matter what happens. Two final questions in our remaining minute or two, and we're talking to Dr. Chris Christie. We're at New England College, and you've been crisscrossing at Granite State. You'll be on the debate stage in Simi Valley, California, the second debate that airs on Fox Business. You had a pretty bad case of COVID. There's a new vaccine now out there. What are your thoughts? Very quickly. Well, I've taken the vaccine up to this point. Um, I've had COVID twice. Um, the first time I had it, I got from Donald Trump, um, preparing him for the debates. Um, and it's, it's an incredible thing. We didn't know it at the time, obviously. But that was before there was any vaccine or any treatments of any kind. This was late September, early October of 2020. Um, he, our last round of debate prep was from Saturday to Tuesday, Tuesday being the debate. And I stayed in Washington, D.C. for those four days. And we all had to get tested when we came into the White House. Before we came in, you got tested. You had to wait over the Eisenhower building. If your test came back negative, you could go to the West Wing. So all of us got tested. We were going into, there were only six or seven of us prepping him. We went to the White House. The president came in that Saturday morning. He had been out playing golf. He came in and we had masks. And I said, Mr. President, we've all tested negative. Um, do you want us to wear the masks or don't you? He said, no, don't wear them. What we didn't know, because he didn't tell us, was that morning he had tested positive. Wow. Every person in that room got COVID, except for Jason Miller. Me, Kellyanne Conway, 
who had worked for him for four years, Bill Stepien, his campaign manager, Hope Hicks, his communications director, um, and Stephen Miller, his speechwriter. He didn't tell any of us. And I wound up in the intensive care unit for seven days. And but for, I think, taking the Eli Lilly, at that time, experimental um, monoclonal cocktail, I don't know that I'd still be here. Because my first two days in intensive care were really bad. And the folks at Eli Lilly trucked that medicine in overnight from Indianapolis to New Jersey so I could have it. And I really wonder whether I'd be here, Steve, if uh, that hadn't happened. So when you're judging Donald Trump's character, if you put aside all the words, fat pig, all the rest of that stuff, put aside all the words, who in October of 2020 would have sat across from six people that were friends and supporters and employees of his and had COVID and said nothing to us? Final question, with about a minute left, Bruce Springsteen. Yes. <laughs> When will he be back? You've seen how many concerts? Uh, 152. <laughs> so you told backstage very quickly the story with the last concert you were at. Yeah, I, I, um, I was. I was at. Well, it was not the last concert I was at. I've been to many, but the Barclays Center in Brooklyn. I went. Um, my wife and I, and my oldest son, we were in the pit in front of the stage um, with a whole bunch of other people. Um, after the concert, I thought Bruce saw me during the show. And my wife thought I was crazy. Oh, yeah, sure. Bruce smiled the way to Yes, you're right, right. We get in the car. We're driving back to New Jersey. My cell phone rings at 11.45 at night, and it's a 732 area code number that I don't recognize. So I answer the phone, and I said, Chris Christie. And he said, go, it's Bruce. And he said, I saw you in the pit tonight. And I went to my wife, oh, I told you. I told you you saw me. And, um, and we've had a very interesting journey, Steve, because Bruce is... Obviously, a pretty liberal Democrat, a uh, conservative Republican, but we both are Jersey guys. We grew up, and we've had ups and downs in our relationship. But um, you know, we had a great conversation that night. Um, I've been to, uh, like I said, 152 shows, starting when I was 13 years old. So I don't drink, I don't do drugs, but that is my vice. Um, I get a lot of Springsteen shows, and so it's been great to see him out there. He's sick right now. Um, hopefully, he'll recover pretty quickly and get back out on tour. Because I want to get to like, you know, 160, 170. And I can't do it if he's not out there. Would he sing at your inauguration if you're president? Oh, that's a lot to ask. I don't know. I don't know. He's still a Democrat, Steve. I don't know. Um, how about how about this? Um, the best I think I can hope for is that I could earn his vote uh, between now and November 24. If I were able to do that, um, I'd be happy. Um, but I'm not counting on it. I, if, if I need one vote to win. I'm not counting on that one, even after going to 152 shows. But the interesting thing has been we've had a lot of good conversations of late about what's going on in the world. And we share, as older guys now from New Jersey, a lot of concerns about the future. And so maybe that's something to build on. Governor Chris Christie here in Hennecker, New Hampshire, thank you very much for being with us here on Sirius XM, the POTUS channel. Hope you'll come back anytime. We'd love to have you. Our thanks to our studio audience, huge thanks to President Wayne Moss Prince, who is here in the audience, Dave Gorab in New York, Liz Aiello, Catherine Caperton from the Series 6 XM team, Patrick Therese, our producer here, Nate Sweet, I'm Steve Scully for Series 6 XM, the POTUS channel in Hennecker, New Hampshire. Governor, thank you for being with us. Thank you, Steve. Thank you.